Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron, and today I would like to present a video lecture that deals with the response of single degree of freedom systems. Here's the problem that we'll look at. We want to determine the response of this system shown to the right, namely a block of mass M connected with a spring and damper, both linear, and allowed to move horizontally. So this is a single degree of freedom system, right? The block can only move in one direction, right? We're assuming that there's no motion up and down. And it really just takes one measurement to specify the configuration, right? So again, it's a single degree of freedom. And if I look at the forces, they arise from the spring and the damper. Now, following our modeling procedure, our first step really is just to identify those forces. So here, we'll recognize that we have a force due to the spring. And we have a force due to the damper. Again, at this point, I'm not concerned what they are. I just want to know that they're there. And in particular, I want to account for all of the forces. Here, these forces arise from the spring and the damper. And nothing else. Right, so we have accounted for all of the forces. We're not really considering any kind of gravitational force. Maybe this is sitting on a table. Um, so the gravitational force would be in and out of the board. It would not affect the motion of this system. So now we begin. Let's first define the coordinates and the directions associated with this system. Right here, everything is going to move horizontally. Right, so we'll need, certainly, this horizontal I direction. And we'll go ahead and add the J direction that accompanies that. Now we need to define coordinates. We know that we're going to have to describe the kinematics and the motion of this block. So to do that, we will measure the displacement of the block with respect to the ground. And we'll define that as Y. Looking at the spring and the damper, that force in the spring and the force in the damper is going to depend on the stretch in the spring and the velocity across the damper. So, in particular, if the unstretched length of this spring is L, then we can define the stretch as X. So here we've measured the displacement of the block with a coordinate y. So if I were to define a point O fixed in the ground and a point B that's fixed in the block, then the position of B with respect to O is y in the i direction. My second coordinate is x, and that measures the stretch in a spring. So here, the displacement of the block, we'll define that as delta R of B, is X in the I direction. So we have these two forces, or the, we have these two coordinates. And now looking at the kinematics of our system, these two coordinates are related, right? So there's a constraint. The position of B with respect to O can be written as y in the i direction with this coordinate directly, but it can also be written as l in the i direction plus x in the i direction. So the fact that these two must be the same implies that my constraint is y is equal to l plus x. Now, in terms of these coordinates and directions that I've defined, we can now write the acceleration. 
so that the acceleration of the block, which is now the second derivative of position, is the second derivative of y in the i direction, or y double dot in the i direction. And I just kind of want you to notice how one step follows from the previous things that we've done. So again, when we're talking about the kinematics, we're making use of the coordinates and directions that we defined earlier. And we knew to define these coordinates and directions because we kind of thought about what's going to happen, right? What's the motion look like? What are the forces that act on this system? We're trying to build up a procedure where one step follows from the previous things that we've done. So the next step that we do is the free body diagram, right? So we've identified these forces. Now I need to go and actually define them in terms of the coordinates and directions that we made use of earlier. All right, so here we want to define the forces. Just a little more about springs and dampers. So we have this spring that we had identified earlier. And of course, it had an unstretched length, which was L. And then the stretch in that spring we defined as X. So here, if I look at the forces, right, I'm going to have a force acting on the right force acting on the left. And so let's define this force on the right as F. And so that this force is minus F. Again, these forces have to be of equal magnitude, opposite direction. And in terms of the coordinates and directions that we've defined, this force is K X in the I direction. As a result, when I come to the block, we're looking for the force that's then applied to the block. So this force and this force have to be of equal magnitude in opposite direction. So that if this is kx in the i direction, this is minus kx in the i direction. Looking at the damper, we have a similar thing. Right? So here I'm going to draw the damper. Uh, this had spring constant K, this has damping constant B. And let's go and use X again as the additional stretch in that damper. So once again, I'll have a force on the left and a force on the right. This one we'll call minus F. Notice that these are different things, even though I'm calling this F and this one F as well. This is the force on the damper, this is the force on the spring. So this force is then B times X dot in the I direction. That's how dampers are defined. Linear dampers, the force is proportional to the velocity across the damper. Just like with a linear spring, the force is proportional to the stretch across the spring. Analogously, the force acting on the block then becomes minus B X dot in the I direction. so that these two forces have equal magnitude in opposite direction. Now we're ready to apply the equations of motion. And here we'll use linear momentum balance. And that is sum of the forces equals mass times the acceleration of the block. Right now, we're really just taking everything that we've done previously and putting it all together. So we're just going to add up the forces. Right? So we had a force minus kx in the i direction. We had a force minus b x dot in the i direction. The mass is m, and the acceleration we defined as y double dot in the i direction. So. I can take these and looking at the I direction, we have minus KX minus B times X dot equals MY dot. 
or y double dot. So I can kind of rearrange this, and we find that m y double dot plus b times x dot plus kx equals 0. Finally, we want to turn this into an equation. Let's do it only on x. Right, so here, y double dot is l double dot plus x double dot. I just took my constraint equation, took two derivatives of each term, but I'll notice that since the length is constant, this is equal to 0, and y double dot is equal to x double dot. So finally, the equation of motion is mx double dot plus bx dot plus kx equals 0. And this is the governing equation of motion for this spring mass damper system that we started off with. So again, we call this a spring mass damper system. And really, it's the fundamental single degree of freedom system that we'll look at. What I mean by that, and, and what we'll show in a later lecture, is that any linear single degree of freedom system is equivalent to a spring mass damper system. So if I understand how this behaves, then I can understand how a lot of different systems behave. Even though they might look completely different, their mathematical equations are, in fact, equivalent. Again, we'll talk a little bit about what equivalency means in a later lecture. Now, I need to solve this equation. And here I've rewritten it, and I have given some general initial conditions. So the solution that we come up with, well, it's got to satisfy the equation of motion. and the initial conditions. Again, here I've given very general initial conditions for the response to the system. Here, to solve this, we will use the method of really good guessing, although it's usually referred to as the method of undetermined coefficients. We'll guess a solution with some unknown coefficients and then try to choose those coefficients so that the assumed form actually satisfies the equation of motion and the initial conditions. Again, we just have to have a really good guess to start off with. What does that guess look like? we'll assume that x is equal to an exponential function, right? So c e to the lambda t. Here, these terms in red are unknown. And these are what we will choose, ultimately, to generate a solution. So, we want to take this, substitute it into the equations, and see if we can make it work. We'll need the derivative of that. So x dot is c lambda e to the lambda t, and x double dot is c times lambda squared e to the lambda t. Every time I take a derivative of e to the lambda t, I get lambda e to the lambda t. So when I substitute this in, the equation of motion looks like m times c lambda squared e to the lambda t plus b times c lambda e to the lambda t 
k times c e to the lambda t equals 0. So now I can actually combine this, factor some things out. I'll factor out a c out front. And I'll factor out e to the lambda t on the other side. And then what's left is m lambda squared plus b times lambda plus k e to the lambda t is equal to 0. So again, I need this left-hand side to vanish for all time by choosing c and lambda appropriately. Clearly, e to the lambda t does not vanish, certainly not for all time. So that we can't fool with, right? But we do have two other pieces here. We have this c out front, and we have this polynomial in lambda inside the parentheses. Well, let's look at this c first. You know, one solution is c is equal to 0. And this is known as the trivial solution. And it's trivial because the result is x of t is equal to 0, right? So if I just put c equals 0 up here, then regardless of what lambda is, x is equal to 0. It's trivial. And, you know, this certainly is a solution. If I make x equals 0, it satisfies the equations of motion. Unfortunately, this cannot be used to satisfy general initial conditions. Obviously, if the initial conditions are all zero, it does work, but that's the only case. So generally, the trivial solution doesn't help us. Instead, we want to look at this polynomial. Remember, lambda is unknown. So if I can make this equal to zero by a proper choice of lambda, right, then I also have a solution. And that will actually give us the general solution. So we want to solve m lambda squared plus b times lambda plus k is equal to zero. And this is known as the characteristic equation. for this system. Notice that it's a polynomial in lambda. Right? So here, let's, let's highlight lambda in red. So what we have is actually a quadratic equation in lambda. Well, that's good because I know how to solve quadratic equations. And I can immediately write down the answer. Here, lambda is equal to minus b divided by 2m plus or minus square root of b over 2m squared minus k over m. This might not look completely familiar to you, but if you take your regular sort of quadratic solution, right, with a's and b's and c's and that kind of stuff, and you do a little bit of algebra, you can pretty quickly get to this. So one thing I'll notice is that it's this quantity plus or minus this quantity. So what that means is there are two solutions. To this quadri quadratic equation that work. Right? One corresponds to plus, and the other corresponds to minus. So, lambda 1 will define as the solution with the plus sign here. So it's minus b over 2m square root plus square root of b over 2m squared minus k over m. And as a result, we have the solution x of 1 of t is, now remember, C doesn't play a role in this. So C can still be anything it wants to be, right? So we'll say it's C1, E to the lambda 1, T. And then we have a second solution. Lambda 2 is minus B over 2M, and now minus 
this quantity, b over 2m squared minus k over m. And that gives me a second solution. x2 is, remember I said c was arbitrary, so it doesn't have to be the same for these two solutions. It can be completely different. Right, so we'll use c2 for that one, e to the lambda 2 times t. Now, fortunately, this is a linear system, right? So we have superposition. If I have two solutions, I can combine those and form a third solution. So, in fact, that's how we'll form the general solution, which is the sum of these two solutions that we found, x1 plus x2. So it's really c1 e to the lambda 1 t, and c2 e to the lambda 2 t. And of course here, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are minus b over 2m plus or minus square root of b over 2m squared minus k over m. Right? This is just what we got from solving the characteristic equation. Now, what about these two unknown constants, C1 and C2? Let's highlight those in red, right? because they still have not been specified. Well, those are used to then satisfy the initial conditions. Right, so we have to choose these appropriately. So again, satisfy the initial conditions, I see. Going back and looking at those initial conditions, x0 was just, here x0 is some value, right? And the initial velocity is some value. So that value is equal to x at time 0. And likewise, x0 dot is equal to x dot at time 0. Well, so how do we use this to find c1 and c2? Well, I'll just evaluate this solution at time 0, right? Because that is x of t as well. So we'll do that in orange. So that's c1 e to the lambda times 0 plus c2 e to the lambda 2, this should be lambda 1, times 0. Well, e to the 0 is just 1, so we get c1 plus c2. Likewise, down here, I need to take a derivative of x to find x dot. Well, that's going to be c1 lambda 1, e to the lambda 1, and then 0, because again, we're evaluating at t equals 0. c2 lambda 2, e to the lambda 2, times 0, and this reduces to c1 lambda 1 plus c2 lambda 2. If you remember, we did this in the previous lecture when we were just looking at a spring and a mass, and we'll do the same thing again. So now we have two equations. We have x0 is equal to c1 plus c2, x0 dot is this, c1 lambda 1 plus c2 lambda 2. Well, two equations, two unknowns. The unknowns, of course, are c1 and c2. And we can solve. Now, there's some algebra involved, and, and I'm going to skip the algebra and go right to the solution. And we find that c1 here is x0 dot minus lambda 2 x 0 divided by lambda 1 minus lambda 2. And c2 is x0 dot minus lambda 1 x0. Lambda 2 minus lambda 1 on the bottom. All right, so again, I basically just took these two equations, solved them for c1 and c2. You might want to pause the video now and, and go through that algebra just to make sure you can do it. Right? But here we have it. If you tell me the initial conditions for the system, right, so x0, x0 dot, and of course I have my equation of motion, then 
The general solution is C1 given by this. And here lambda 1, lambda 2 are known in terms of the system parameters times e to the lambda 1t. C2 times e to the lambda 2t is then added to that for the general solution. So really, you know, that's it. There's obviously more to this. And in particular, I will, well, I'll, I'll note something, right? So here, lambda 1 and lambda 2, if they're real, right, everything is really nice, right? It just goes along as we've written here. But I want you to notice that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are complex. Right? So they're not purely real. They're complex if b is less than 2 times the square root of km, which means that this piece under the square root is negative. Right? So again, if this quantity is negative, which happens if b is less than 2 square root of km, then lambda is complex. And our solution would have e to a complex number. Well, we can deal with that. Right, we'll see how to do that in the next lecture, right? But it is sort of a, an additional feature of these systems, and it gives different kinds of behaviors, right? So the next lecture, we'll really look at trying to solve this system, right, for different values of damping and mass and stiffness. But for now, that's it. Um, thanks a lot, and I will see you again.